Before I lift my cares, I will lift my arms. I want to know you, I want to find you in every season, in every moment. Before I bring my need, I will bring my heart. aspect of God's nature is that God is holy which means that God in his goodness will never do anything that violates his holiness as we go through our daily lives in this world both our outer man and our inner person can get stains hate and anger jealousy and pride and lust and all kinds of things that, that that are filthiness of the inner man but he says I am the Lord your sanctify I will work in your life to sanctify you which is to make you holy God says I will do that in your life greetings and thank you so much for tuning in to living strong today as always it's our joy and delight to come your way and spend this time with you uh, in God's presence over the last several weeks we've been talking about the holiness of God we've examined uh, God's holiness uh, how he himself, he is our sanctifier, the one who sanctifies us, makes us holy. And we saw also how God works that holiness in us, how uh, God's holiness becomes a part of our living, our lifestyle. And uh, we talked about how that happens and the process uh, that we as God's people go through in experiencing his holiness in a day-to-day -day, uh, basis. So on the program today, we want to do something different. We have with us in the studio uh, quite a few people 
who've come uh, to ask questions and uh, just to interact on the subject of holiness. So what we're going to do is we're going to let them ask questions and uh, then we'll do our best to respond to those questions. And so, uh, guys, you can take it away. And uh, yeah. Pastor, I have a question. Uh, since Christ died for me, I am already forgiven of my sins and I'm guaranteed a place in heaven. So why should I live a holy life? Okay. Right. That's a good uh, question, Pratika. So the question here is, uh, you know, Jesus already died for us. Our sins are forgiven. He's paid for all our sins. Uh, so then why even consider or even take the effort to live uh, a holy life, right? So uh, while it is true that Jesus has uh, paid for all of our sins, he's died, he's made us holy, uh, we need to understand how, uh, we're just looking at the negative side, how sin affects our lives. And I want to just point out three things very quickly. First of all, you know, sin affects our relationship with God. Uh, it doesn't change our position in Christ. Uh, it doesn't change our relationship with God in the sense that it doesn't change our, our uh, standing before God, but it affects on our ability to relate to God. So that's the first thing. And if you want to look at an, uh, an example, you can th think about a disobedient son or a child. You know, when a, when, a, when a child is disobedient to its parent, it doesn't cease being the child. It doesn't, you know, the parent doesn't stop being the parent. Uh, that relationship does not change, but it affects uh, the interactions, the relationship in terms of interactions. You know, uh, maybe the child sucks away and, uh, you know, hides and is feeling guilty or ashamed or whatever, you know, there is that interaction that, that is affected because of that disobedience. And, you know, you can just apply that in our relationship with God. Uh, we don't stop being his children. We are still uh, are loved and accepted by God, but our ability to interact uh, is affected. So one, a sin affects our ability to interact with God, our relationship with God. Uh, you know, and there are scriptures on this, First John chapter 1, you know, the, uh, John uh, writes, he says, you know, uh, if we walk in the light as he is in the light, then we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. But then he says, if we walk in darkness, then, and if we say that we have no sin, then we are deceiving ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So in this walking with God, I all, God is light, so I also need to walk in the light. In that same epistle in 1 John chapter 3, uh, John brings us out. He says, you know, if a heart condemns us or if a heart does not condemn us, then we have confidence towards God. You know, see, we're always welcome. You know, God is always loving, welcoming us. But our heart, if I feel guilty, I have sin in my heart. If my heart condemns me, then my ability to approach God is affected. It's not like God doesn't, has changed the welcome. It's always there but it affects my ability to approach him. So if a heart condemns us, uh, then, you know, uh, we don't have confidence towards God. So that's the first thing. Secondly, sin also affects our walk of authority. You know, does the Bible says this. For instance, the Bible says, submit yourselves to God, resist the devil, and he'll flee from you, right? So before I resist the devil, there's something I need to be doing. I need to be walking in submission. I need to be walking in obedience to God. So uh, it's really our submission to God that gives us the authority over the enemy. Or in another place, you know, uh, Ephesians 4, verse 27, uh, Paul says, he says, uh, give no place to the devil. You know, be angry, don't sin, and don't give any place to the devil. So implying that if I'm walking in sin, I'm just giving the enemy an access, a foothold in my life, right? So that's a second reason why we need to keep sin out of our lives and walk in holiness. And thirdly, I think it affects our ministry and our ability to serve God. For instance, think about our own testimony, right? Uh, I'm loved by God, uh, uh, I am in Christ, I am a believer, but if I'm not living a holy life, my ability to tell other people about Jesus is affected. And they're not going to take me seriously. Say, what, are you, what, are you, what are you talking about? You know, God can save you. I mean, I don't see anything different in your life. So our ability to minister, our ability to serve, our testimony is affected and so on. So I, I would point out these three areas on why, although our sins are forgiven, we still need uh, to live uh, holy life. That's a good question. Good. All right. Anybody else? So, Pastor, if I'm a believer, 
I am the righteousness of God in Christ. So why do I have to lead a holy life? Right, right, right. That's a good question. You know, it's, now this has to do with righteousness. Uh, our uh, standing before God. So the question is this. So if, as a believer, I'm already righteous, he's already made me righteous, so what's the big point in trying to live holy, right? So now, in the Bible, righteousness is a very, very powerful theme, a very powerful subject. And the Bible tells us, and Paul, this is in his epistle to Romans, he says, you know, that righteousness is given to us as a free gift, right? That means uh, we are made righteous by the grace of God, and is given to us freely as a gift, right? Now, righteousness in Scripture has two things, two sides to it. It's like two sides of the same coin, right? One side is our right standing with God. To, so righteousness means to be approved and accepted in the eyes of God. Now, that has been given to us as a free gift. We can't earn it, but Jesus, because of what he did on the cross, he's saying, here it is. I am making you approved and accepted in the eyes of God. So righteousness is a state of being accepted and approved in the eyes of God. But the other side of the coin has to do with righteousness as a lifestyle of me living right before God, living right in a way that is acceptable and pleasing to God. So righteousness has two sides to the coin. Uh, you know, the coin is not, comp it's one coin. But the coin is not complete if you only have one side to it. You know, we all understand that. I can't take a coin to somebody and say, this is a coin, but it's only got one side. <laughs> What's the other the other side, you know? The other side is us living out this righteousness. Now, we're not living out righteousness or we're not having righteous living in order to attain righteousness in the eyes of God. That is already given to us as a free gift. But we live right because he has made us these kinds of beings, these people who have already been put in a place pleasing and acceptable to God. So now we also want to live that way, right? out of that. Now, and I will just uh, point out a few things in Scripture. For instance, you know, if you look at Paul's epistle to Romans, Romans 5, he says we are the righteousness of God. But then right after that, he starts talking about sin in our lives and how we need to get rid of sin in our lives in Romans 6, 7, and 8. So he says, you are righteousness, but now let's talk about the sin in our lives and how to get rid of it, right? So he's talking about the practical side, living out of that righteousness. Another scripture I would refer us to is in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verses 22 to 24, where um, uh, Paul writes, he says, you know, put off the old man. And put on the new man, which is created in the image of God in righteousness and true holiness. So you see, you are righteousness, but now put him on. Meaning, let him show up in your life, in the way you live. And let people see that. So that would be my response. Uh, the fact that yes, we are the righteousness of God, uh, but we live righteous because uh, uh, he has made us those kinds of beings who want to pursue righteousness. Very good question. Thank you. Uh, the Bible says that we have already been blessed with every spiritual blessing and this is available to us by our position in Christ. And it's also because we have received it freely by his grace. So why do I have to live a holy life? How does holy living ex uh, affect my practical experience? Right, right. That's a good question, Marshall. And, and just for the benefit of those watching us, you know, the question is, you know, God has already given everything to us freely. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He's already given it to us. So does my living holy actually make a difference in getting something more from God? I mean, he's already given everything to us. How, how is my living holy going to make a difference if I already have everything uh, given to me freely by God? Now, what we see in Scripture is that, you know, uh, God, the way God works is this, like this. He completes everything in the spiritual realm. The work is done. And then in the natural realm, he tells us to live out of what he has already completed for us. So, the, uh, so let's put it like this. Uh, he deposits all the money in the bank account. He says, it's already there for you. But here's how you withdraw it. Now, in order for you to withdraw it, here's what you need to do. 
you need to go to the ATM. You need to put your card in. You need to put the right numbers in, right? You need to put the right pin in. If you don't put the right pin in, the money is in the bank. It's yours in your name, but you don't put the right pin in. You're not going to get it out. You can talk to the machine. You can do whatever you want. But you've got to put the right pin in. Then you get it out, right? So you can look at it this uh, holiness, living right, uh, living a holy life as the other side of the transaction, right? So God on his part has put everything into our account. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing. But then he says, one of the things that you and I, we as people on earth, need to do in order to be able to make those withdrawals, in order to experience those things in everyday life, is living a holy life. Now, what are some of the scriptures that we can see here on this? Well, I'll just quickly mention some of these things. And, you know, for us to really, uh, we are in Christ, but for us to experience the, 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 the life in Christ, we need to be clean. Jesus put it like this in John 13 and verse 8. Um, he was going to wash the feet of his disciples. And that was symbolic. It was actually an act of humility, but it was also very symbolic of his cleansing on their lives. Because when Peter says, you know, Lord, how, you, you don't need to wash me. And Jesus gives him his answer in John 13, 8. He says, if Peter, if I don't wash you, you have no part in me. Meaning, look, this is something beyond just me taking some dirt off your feet. It is you having that experience, being a part of me. So his cleansing in our lives is what enables us to really live out that life uh, that we have in Christ. So that's very important, right? Living clean or living righteous life. Secondly, we also see in Scripture that uh, uh, holiness is connected to deliverance and experiencing our possessions. And this is Obadiah uh, chapter 1 and verse 17. It says, in Mount Zion, there will be deliverance and there will be holiness and the house of Jacob will possess their possessions. So in Mount Zion, among God's people, there will be deliverance. But there's also holiness. And that's how God's people are going to possess their possessions. So possessions, God's given it to us. But that connecting part of deliverance and possessing is holiness. And so it's very important. And also, just to make, mention one more thing and just about this whole thing of living out our lives, is, uh, is, is serving God. You know, Paul writes about this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verses 19, 20, 21. He says, you know, uh, if a man will cleanse himself of what is evil, he will be a vessel of honor, fit for the master's use. Right? So I want to be used by God. How can God use me? I need to present myself as a vessel that's clean. And like this, you know, we see these many practical implications of us uh, uh, or the, the benefits of living holy. Right? You live in holiness, all the God has made all the deposit as you walk in holiness, then you begin to enjoy your making those withdrawals into your life and walking in the benefits uh, He's given to us. Okay, I think we have time for one more question before we uh, finish up the episode. Anyone else? So, Pastor, one of the points you mentioned was righteousness is living right. And we know that we all have a tendency to mess up and do things which are not pleasing to God. Um, and the Bible says sin separates us from God. So the question is, if we sin, does that make us unholy? And if so, how do we go back to a place of holiness? Right. That's an important question because, you know, the fact is, uh, even though in God's eyes, he has made us righteous, the fact is, we all mess up, right? We do things that we don't really want to do or we don't intend to do, but we do it, right? Uh, under the pressure of a situation, under the pressure of circumstances, we do sin, right? So what, how should our response be? What should our, uh, how do we respond to that? Uh, and that's a very good question. I think the first thing is for us to recognize sin, that we have done something wrong, right? And like we said earlier in the episode, it does not change who we are. Right? So just because I sin, it doesn't mean I stop being a child of God or I stop being holy and accepted, accepted in his eyes. No, that is, I, I'm always, we are always loved and accepted in his eyes. But I need to recognize sin as sin. So John writes in that same passage we referred to earlier, First John chapter 1, verses 5 through 10, that entire passage, he says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. That means, look, if I've done something wrong, I must 
acknowledge that, right? Like Proverbs 28, verse 13 says, Whoever covers his sin will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them, he is going to be blessed, right? So I, I shouldn't just hide it. I should, God, I, I did something wrong. I confess and I forsake. And that's when it leads me into a place of blessing. So I think the first thing to do is, okay, yes, I, I recognize sin as sin. I say, yes, God, I've done something wrong. and I've done something that displeases you. And you know, sin, first and foremost, affects God. See, sometimes we think, oh, sin affects me or affects that person. First and foremost, it affects God. It's like that same analogy. When a child does something wrong, the child may not realize it, but the parent is the one who feels it. The parent feels, why did my child do that? Why did my child say that? Why did my, or why didn't he do this? You know, the parent also feels the pain, right? And it's like what David said, you know, and David acknowledged this in Psalm 51, verse 3. Yeah, you know, after he had committed sin and realized it, he says, against you and you only I have sinned. And actually he had wrong people too, you know? But he realizes that what he did affects God. Against you and you only I have sinned. You know, it, 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 it displeases God. So we need to understand, God, I have hurt you, I have affected your heart. Uh, realize that. And then we confess, we forsake. And then we do what uh, John said, you know, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need to accept that. God, you know, uh, I have said I'm sorry and accept your forgiveness. Now the wrong thing to do is keep going back to the say, going to God, uh, asking or saying sorry for the same thing 20 times, you know, <laughs> that, you know, once is enough, right? It, it's, we have to get it into our mind. Once is enough, you know. All that God wants is for you to recognize that, you know, we've done something wrong uh, and, and then he makes the slate clean, right? The blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses us from all sin. I think our time's up, guys. Thank you so much for this time to interact. Let's just pray. Let's pray for the audience. Let's pray for those who've been watching us. Uh, let's pray for God's blessing on their lives. And we trust that the few things we spoke about uh, would enrich their lives. Let's pray together before we close. Father, we thank you for the opportunity, opportunity uh, to spend this time together around your word. We pray especially for those watching, Lord. Uh, we pray that the truths that have been shared here will be a blessing into their hearts and into their lives, Father. We pray that they will be encouraged. We pray they will experience freedom. We pray that your power will touch them right now and release, Lord, healing, deliverance, and empowering to live victorious lives. We pray this blessing for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us on the telecast. Don't forget to go to our church website. Uh, you'll see that on your screen. We've got all our TV programs. We've got a lot of free resources on our website. You can download all our publications. So make sure you visit our website and also drop us an email. We'd love to hear from you uh, to know how these telecasts are enriching your life. And until next time, remember, live life the Jesus way. We're here to be salt, seasoning that brings out the God flavors of this earth, a light bringing out the God colors in the world. God is not a secret to be kept. We are going public with this, as public as a city on a hill. We are in a crucial time in history where the urgency to fulfill God's mandate of reaching souls and making disciples has never been greater and more urgent. How is the body of Christ going to respond to this enormous challenge ahead of us? All People's Church began with a small congregation of 10 people. And with the mercies of God, we've grown to over a thousand people. And we have trained and released several people across our nation. But we are not going to stop here. God wants to do bigger and greater things than ever before through us. And so we need to be ready to release greater things across our city and across our nation. For this, we're getting ready to scale up and build APC World Outreach and Equipping Center. This will serve as an equipping center and a mission space using state-of-the-art technology to train, equip, release, and support ministers across our nation and across the globe. In phase one of this project, our goal is to acquire 
approximately five to six acres of land. That's the first step. In phase two, we are going to set up our Bible college and a media center. The Bible college will have classes that are equipped to train students, both residential and non-residential students. We'll also have the means to uh, provide distance learning so that students from around the world can participate in live classroom sessions as well as offline lectures. We'll also be able to bring in programs from reputed Bible colleges from around the world as well as international faculty who can come and equip pastors and worship leaders and worship ministries and other kinds of ministries. Think about the impact that we can have. If we graduate 200 students each year and each student in their lifetime impacts at least 1,000 people, then with every graduating batch, we are potentially reaching 200,000 people. In 10 years, this is 2 million people and counting. We'll also be able to set up a media center that provides content to reach a connected world, as well as it will enable us to set up satellite churches across our nation using technology. In phase three, we will be building our sanctuary where our church family can come together, be trained, equipped, nurtured, and cared for. To make this vision happen, we need your partnership. We know that it's gonna take some amount of sacrifice, but remember every investment you make today will reap great rewards for the kingdom of God in the near future. You can go to our church website, apcwo.org build to impact page, where we will give you information on how you can make your contribution or make your pledge of what you will be able to give in the months to come. And we look forward to your partnership. We want to thank you in advance for what you will do to be a part of this vision and to see it happen. Together, let's be salt and light in our city, a voice to our nation and to the nations. So let's work together to build to impact.